Hello everyone, this is your VLSI design course. Uh, this semester, summer 20, 2020, uh, two of us will be taking the course. I am Avira Sanakib, lecturer, Department of Tripoli, Black University. You can reach me at my this email ID. And the, another faculty is Abhijit Biswas, who is also a lecturer in Department of Tripoli. And if you need to reach him, you can reach him <clears throat> in this email ID. So before we move on to the VLSI course, uh, the actual course content, uh, let's discuss about uh, about the history a little bit, how everything started. So if we have to trace back to this uh, to the beginning of this semiconductor industry that we are talking about, we have to go back to 1958. During 1958, the first integrator circuit was developed. It was a basic flip flop. I'm sure you have heard about flip flop in your uh, digital logic design course or digital electronic course. So it was built with just two transistors and it was built by Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments. So that was the beginning of transistor and today uh, we can see from this picture that at that time the transistor were really big. But at present in a small processor, for example, in Core i7 processor, there are 2.3 billion transistors. In a 64 GB flash memory that you use, that is the pen drives that we use, they contain more than 16 billion transistors. So at present, the size of transistors has uh, decreased way at a very large scale as compared to uh, to the past. So that is the main concern of the course VLSI, very large scale integration. Concept of very large scale integration is we keep the chip size same. In the same size, we try to accommodate more and more transistors. That is, we uh, maybe in 1958, in if in this size we could fit 10 transistors, now we want to fit maybe 1 million transistors or 1 billion transistors in the same size. That is, we want to decrease the size and we want to uh, increase the number of transistors at a very high scale. So it is called very large scale integration or VLSI. Now, why do we have to uh, we why do you have to learn this course what what are our advantages or what is the scope of the semiconductor in industry to know that uh, it's good to know that about 53 percent compound annual growth is found over last 50 years that is the semiconductor technology is the fastest growing technology in the world no te other technology has grown so fast and Second important thing is it is driven by miniaturization. That is, it's trying to make everything small. So what is the advantage if everything turns small? When the sizes are smaller, less materials will be required. So the chips will be cheaper. They will be faster because the current will have to uh, pass less path and the power will be lower. So we'll get smaller things in a cheaper price and they will act faster. All our advantages. And those have wrought great uh, changes in the society. For example, at one time, uh, say in the middle of 20th century, uh, you could see computers there were larger than two, three rooms combined. But at present, uh, uh, they did not have uh, very much uh, very high uh, processing power. But at present, the mobile phone that you carry uh, is a million times uh, more, has million times more processing power than that huge computer so it's making our lives easier and now about uh, about the financial aspects of it we can see that uh, the curve of annual sales in 2008 about 10 to the power 19 transistors were manufactured that is 1 billion for every human on this planet so e for number uh, each human being had 1 billion transistors so this number is a huge number so what we can uh, what we can actually understand from this curve or this number is that we can see this is an upward trend as a result we can see the sales is rising global semiconductor billions in terms of billions of usd that is the sales is rising at a very high rate and the rise is linear at no point the sale is decreasing so this is a very promising industry and which should inspire us more to learn about VLSI. Now, let's go to actual history of it, how everything started. So, the start of integration uh, will have to start from invention of transistors. 
before transistors were invented there were vacuum tubes which were in the uh, in the middle part which were there till the middle part of 20th century they were very large and they would heat up the room what's the problem with heating up the room the heat is actually loss so if more heat is dissipated there was more loss as a result they were very power hungry devices and since they were very large they were also very expensive to produce and uh, because of those those vacuum tubes were not suitable for us so in order to replace the vacuum tubes in 1947 the first transistor were made in bell labs john bardin and walter wettin they made the first transistor and from then onwards the uh, the market or the manufacture of transistor or the research oriented with the transistors in peace by a great great margin so we have learned from our device courses for csc students maybe it's csc 251 for triple e students it's triple e 205 in device courses we have learned about different types of transistors we have learned about bipolar transistors or bjt they can be npn or pnp uh, how we can control bjt we know that B bjt contains an emitter collector and base if we inject a current through the base uh, this amount of this base current modulates the current passing from uh, collector to emitter so we can say bjt is a current driven device since it is current driven device this bjt consumes a lot lo lot more power and as a result because of consumption of greater power integration density is affected that is a uh, bi bipolar transistor is very difficult to integrate at a very large scale so because uh, because of the difficulties with bjts metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors or mosfets were introduced we have al already learned about mosfets the basics of it n mos p mos uh, we control mosfets by applying a voltage through the gate and we can see that the gate of the mosfet is isolated or insulated as a result when we apply a voltage here no current actually flows through the gate into the mosfet as a result the current uh, this is a voltage driven device and the power loss is loss, uh, less in mosfet as a result it allows very high integration now mosfet is regularly used in our vlsi industry in 1970s the technology contained only n mos transistor that is it contained some resistive elements and and n mos n mos uh, and n mos net network and a resistive network this was a very inexpensive and easy easy technology but the problem was that it consumed a lot of power even when it was idle that is even when the circuit didn't do anything it used to consume power and it used to consume a lot of power so from 1980s we have developed cmos processors cmos is complementary mos process so in that case there is a pull up network containing pmos and a pull down network containing nmos so it contains both pmos and nmos which are complementary as a result it is called complementary mos or cmos process in cmos process we will learn about details in this course in cmos process uh, idle power is very low as a result from 1980s till now the cmos process is prevalent now a very important factor in vlsi industry or the semiconductor industries is moore's law uh, gordon moore in 1965 did did a thing he plotted in a graph paper uh, he plotted the year and the number of transistors that each chip contained that is in the x axis were di different years in y axis contain the number of transistors that each chip contain but y axis is not linear it's logarithmic he plotted th this this curve from the data of 1965 64 63 and 62 and he th he then observed a linear linear uh, relationship and he predicted that this relationship will continue to be linear actually this is not linear relationship this is linear linear only because this y axis or the number of components is in logarithmic scale if this was in a linear scale this relation will be exponential and he had uh, he had given a, he had given a hypothesis that the transistor counts will double every 26 months that is in in about 26 uh, in about 2 years the transistor counts will be double that is if if uh, if inside this chip 
we can fit two transistors now in after two years we will be able to fix four transistor after two more years eight after two more years 16 so this is what uh, gordon moore plot uh, gordon moore suggested and it's called moore's law so in the moore's law these four nodes that is 1965 1964 3 and 2 were actual data and this dotted line over here was actually his anticipation from there we we come to different integration levels at the beginning uh, only 10 or less number of gates could be uh, fit inside could fit inside this chip at that scale the uh, level was called ssi or small scale integration later on after certain years uh, about 1000 gates could be accommodated in the same area of the chip so at that scale, stage we called it medium scale integration after again certain years if we follow the Moore's law after again certain years we will find that even more gates about 10,000 gates could be fitted inside the same chip that stage of uh, operation was called large scale integration and if we could fit uh, the time we could fit more than 10,000 chips in the same area we call this very large scale integration so at present actually very large scale integration is also uh, uh, an old scale of integration we have reached to ulsi ultra large scale integration here in the same chip we can uh, we can put millions of transistors so uh, the graph that gordon moore draw had only four points and uh, now we can see that since 1970 to here to 2005 we have seen that there is a gradual rise in uh, gradual rise in number of transistors again we can see this is logarithmic scale as a result this linear or in actual sense this exponential curve is followed that is moore's law is still prevalent at very recent times moore's uh, because of some difficulties in scaling moore's law has not been quite uh, quite followed and scientists are, pre uh, are predicting that moore's law will soon be soon be uh, uh, will soon not be effective anymore but we are, we still haven't come to that stage yet now another important thing is feature size from the beginning we are saying we want to decrease the size we want to decrease the size so what do we want to decrease so we are working with MOS technology, so we know MOS has two parameters, a length and area. This length of MOSFET is called feature size of transistor. So we want to decrease this length. So we have seen that uh, feature size every 2-3 years, there are 30% decrease in feature size. From this graph also we can see, as the years progresses, the feature size decreases slowly. Uh, feature size were very high in... Uh, in micrometer these are in micrometer it was very high in 1970s but in 2015 it's very low at about 22 nanometer at present uh, it has decreased to about 7 nanometers so the feature size is gradually decreasing now the decreasing feature feature size actually gives us some uh, some benefits what are the benefits firstly the size is decreased since the size is decreased the power consumption is less so since the power consumption is less, efficiency increases. Again, the speed also increases. The clock frequency and the processor performance, all of this increases with decrease of feature size. So as the number of transistors rises, the clock frequency, uh, clock frequency increases, the performance also increases. This increase we can see from the linear curve about different processors. This 4004 was the, maybe the first PC and here we have plotted up to core 2 duo and we have seen that gradually the performance and the clock speed has been increasing that is the performance is getting faster and faster with each new day so this is about a brief history and the introduction to the course in the next course we'll be going into the details of the things uh, i hope i really hope this course will be enjoyed to you all thank you so much